Hey guys, so we're just going to pick up now with the last set of lectures for this week. Um, so we've been talking a lot about human memory and now we're going to talk a little bit about attention and also its relationship with memory. Now in some of our earlier lectures we kind of touched on the idea of attention but we're just going to go into a lot more depth about attention today. So the learning objectives for this set of lectures is that by the end of this lecture you'll be able to define what we mean by attention um, when we're talking about attention in psychology and also to be able to describe the relationship between attention and memory, as well as between attention and other higher order cognitive processing or processes. And finally, to be able to compare um, two theorized streams of attention. So we'll talk about two, a two uh, process stream of attention theory in this lecture, and then also to be able to locate some of their neuroanatomical coordinates, meaning what parts of the brain are involved in both types of attention. So to begin, just to start with a very simple question, and that is, what do we even mean by attention or what is attention? And here's a quote from a very famous psychologist, William James. So William James is commonly regarded as the father of experimental psychology, at least in um, America. And so in 1890, in his Principles of Psychology book, William James famously, famously in psychology, that is, defined attention as, everyone knows what attention is. It is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one of what seem several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are, are, are of its essence. So it's a bit of a mouthful of a definition, but really in this first sentence here where he says everyone knows what attention is, uh, implies that, well, we do kind of all have some sense about what attention is. And, and this is actually kind of true of most things in psychology. I mean, in a sense, even a naive person, naive meaning someone who's not a psychology major, for example, has some innate psychology. Um, and that's because psychology as a discipline, as a, as a field of study, it's, well, it's the study of human behavior, well, behavior in general, but largely we're, we're concerned with human behavior. And this means that most people do kind of have some understanding of the kinds of things that we're researching, even if the ways in which we research them are much more nuanced. Um, so the farther you progress in your studies, you'll hopefully come to have a, a deeper appreciation for human behavior and for the field of psychology in general than you would if you were you know, not a psychology major. Um, so this idea that everyone knows what attention is, and then he does go on to kind of you know, give some uh, somewhat long definition, uh, well, we can actually kind of take this and, and break it down a little bit. And so an easier way perhaps to think of attention is really, let's think of attention as a cognitive process. And it's a cognitive process because it's something that's occurring in the mind. So this is some aspect of cognition. And in particular, it's a cognitive process that's necessary for the mind to allocate resources to desired inputs. So still a little bit of a, a mouthful here, and what we're really meaning here when we're choosing to allocate resources to desired inputs, and what I mean to say when attention is choosing to allocate resources to desired inputs is that in everyday life, as you're walking through the world, you're driving through the world, wherever you are in your environment, there's a lot of stimuli that you know, surround you. So there's a lot of external noises, um, a lot of external uh, visual things that you might see, things you might be touching or um, emotions, of course. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on at any given time in any given, uh, any given environment. So the idea of allocating resources, well, we know from our earlier lectures that cognition is limited. In particular, we talked about working memory a couple of lectures back and we saw that working memory, this very short term memory that lasts about one to 30 seconds, if you'll remember from our lectures earlier, has a severely limited capacity. In fact, working memory is limited to about three or four bits or chunks of information. And this entails that we don't have a limit, an unlimited supply of resources to go around to process everything that is going on in our environment. Everything that's happening in our surroundings cannot possibly all be processed um, by higher order cognitive processes. And when I say higher order cognitive processes, I mean things like working memory. This is a higher order process because it's evolutionarily quite old, uh, newer, newer than um, a lot of other things. Like for example, all organisms have some type of attentional mechanisms. Well, attention is choosing basically which of the multiple stimuli that are going on in our world around us 
should we um, direct to higher order cognitive um, processes? Uh, so again, to reiterate, attentional processes choose which of the sensory inputs are being are, are to be filtered onto other processing stages of cognition, such as working memory. And in fact, this is quite easy to think about if we refer back to one of our models or really any of our models of working memory that we discussed a few lectures ago. So here I'm re-shown the Atkinson and Schifrin model of working memory. This again was the first model to pre, uh, proposed to explain what working memory is. And in this model, there's some input, some stimuli from the environment. These can be things like sounds, these can be visual things, um, and these pass first into a sensory memory store. And sensory memory, again, is this very, very short-term uh, memory store. So auditory information is passing through from the ears or visual information from the eyes. And some of that information is being registered. Some of that information is forgotten right away. And here in the figure, this now I've highlighted here in yellow, here's where attention is proposed to be operating. Attention is choosing which of these sensory um, bits of information do we pass on into working memory, where again, short-term memory and working memory are interchangeable. So attention is operating right here. It serves as a filter in some sense, a filter to decide what passes into short-term or working memory. And so here's an example. Just imagine that you're driving um, and you happen to have a noisy child in your car. Well, attention is necessary if you want to really pay attention to the road and you know, to avoid getting into an accident. And attention can be useful for selectively tuning out auditory distractors in this case. In this case, the auditory distractor would be the noisy children in the car. And so this idea is that attention is serving kind of as like bottleneck. So here's just a classic example of a bottle, a glass bottle. And you'll note that bottlenecks get narrower, of course, at the top than they are at the bottom. And this has actually been transferred into a, a cognitive model, so Broadbent's model of attention. And this idea is that some sensory information, again, it's coming in, and there's this selective filter. This is where attention is working to choose what gets passed on to higher level processing. So in this particular example, there are two streams of information. There is an attended message, which is given here in green. This is A, and an unattended message. So perhaps these are um, two different people are talking to you. And you really just want to be paying attention to what is it that person A is saying, and you want to avoid uh, what person B is saying because uh, maybe they're just a, a really bad advice giver, for example, and you really just want to pay attention to this person. And so both um, A and B are speaking to you. And so that information is loading into your sensory memory. In this case, it's loading into um, echoic memory. So this is memory for uh, auditory information. Attention then chooses which of these two streams of information to direct higher order processing to. Higher order processing being things like working memory. So actually we see it down here. Um, and in this case, it's filtering out the irrelevant information. So you see the red arrow dies out here at selective, at the selective attentional filter. It does not pass on to higher level processing. So this idea is that attention serves as a bottleneck of sorts. And the question is, is all irrelevant information actually filtered out? So does attention always filter um, all irrelevant information out? And we might think, well, possibly, but maybe not. This attentional bottleneck does, however, imply that irrelevant information is not being passed on to higher level processing centers. But next time, we'll pick up here and we'll talk about this cocktail party phenomenon, which suggests actually that perhaps some irrelevant information does move on um, beyond sensory memory. So we'll pick up from there next time.